All right. Well, good morning. Welcome to the October 27th uh, Commissioner Student Advisory Council. We have a, a great full agenda that was uh, essentially set by our students and Dr. Glass today. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to our commissioner, Dr. Glass. Thanks, Tony. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for, for being here. This is a an advisory that uh, Tony and I and the rest of the staff at Katie really look forward to connecting with uh, every time we get together. Um, we changed up the structure of this just a little bit uh, for this meeting uh, and something that we hope to do going forward with all of our advisories. Um, and so you got to you got to try it out first. And that is that we wanted the people who are on the advisory to really determine the agenda. What are the things that you want to talk about that you think are the most important? And then that that forms uh, what what we discuss. So uh, Tony sent out a uh, survey and asked for feedback on what folks were most interested in talking about. Mental health came up again, um, just uh, uh, managing through COVID and all the stresses that we're under on a number of levels in addition to COVID uh, right now. And so Damien uh, is on with us uh, this morning to, to walk us through um, some thinking about that. Um, also, um, the department's work around racial equity uh, came up as a major a topic or priority, and we have the incoming deputy commissioner and the department's chief uh, equity officer, uh, Thomas Woods Tucker, coming on with us this morning. And he's having some technical issues, I think, right now. But Tony and um, uh, and uh, Andrew and Megan are working working on that to try and support him. We may have to delay that just a little bit to make sure that he gets in, but uh, he's excited to meet you as well. Um, there was a, a priority around how student testing is going to work this spring, and that's a really good question right now. So, but we'll talk about what we know so far. And then um, we'll, we'll end up talking a little bit about uh, what learning looks like this, this fall, this spring, uh, and beyond. Uh, so just all the disruptions that we've had, the shifts to NTI and then back to in-person and back to NTI. Uh, what, is that, what does that look like going forward? And so those are the topics that we wanted to um, uh, work on with you. They were actually the ones that you chose. But why don't we kick things off with uh, Dr. Damien Sweeney is on here and he has distributed a link in the chat uh, to go ahead and uh, take part in um, what he's got planned for us. So, Dr. Sweeney, why don't you take it away? All right. Thank you, Dr. Glass. Um, students, it's really nice to be with you again. Uh, the last time that we spoke, you we talked a lot about social emotional um, health and well-being, and you identified um, coping strategies as a huge need uh, for students in the Commonwealth. So, I want to quickly go through um, uh, just a mini session with you this morning on that. Okay, so you should be in the Nearpod, and adults, I would love for you to join as well. Um, your social and emotional well-being is really, really important. Um, as you know, it's hard to take care of others if we can't take if, if we're not taking care of ourselves. So, um, so I'd like everybody to get on the Nearpod and join me here this morning. All right, so let's get started. Um, the reason for this, again, it's important to connect and build community. Um, we also need to normalize stress and anxiety and look for ways to cope with these emotions. It's easy for us to um, to try and create like the perfect image um, and, and to show the world that we are all well and everything is just fine. Um, but we know that um, most of us are just under a lot of stress right now um, and that stress creates a lot of anxiety for many of us as well. All right, so let's get started. So you should be able to um, see a pin in the left bottom of your screen and just go ahead and draw how you're doing or put a check mark by, um, by any of the faces that you see on your screen. So let us know how you're doing, okay? You choose any color you want, just put a check mark on um, by, the, by the emoji that you see that best describes how you're doing. All right, so we're starting to see some come in. See a lot of smiley faces. Okay, remember, be honest, be honest. That's what we we want. Okay, we got some some smiley teeth showing. We got some. Oh, I, I, it kind of seems like you're a little bit concerned potentially. Um, maybe not so well this morning. Okay, let's give another thirty seconds or so. All right. Some of you are just kind of neutral right now. 
How do I make myself? Okay. All right. All right. Very good. Okay, so thank you for for joining us for that. We've got a, uh, somebody with a couple of different different emotions right now. All right, very good. So let's move on. Um, also, describe something you're excited about or something you're worried about today. And then again, share whatever's on your mind. I'm going to make this anonymous so nobody knows who's typing what. So if something, if there's something that you're excited about or something you're worried about today um, and you'd like to share, please let us know. I hear some vigorous typing. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right. I can I can definitely relate. We've got an athlete um, excited for basketball to start next week. Okay, cool. Get to see my best friend tonight. Love it. Um, really, really important to to have the opportunity to, for something to look forward to, like that. So that's great. Um, concerned about college applications. It's a perpetual stressor that can't really be alleviated until the spring. Worried about the security of your parents' jobs. Very serious stuff. Definitely appreciate you sharing. Um, excited to, uh, uh, very excited um, to attend the regional volleyball tournament this evening. Um, my last school just got eliminated from that tournament last night, so it's a bummer. Um, but I'm excited for your team. I have early action applications due at the end of the week, um, so excited. Potentially nervous about that. Excited to spend Halloween with friends this weekend, socially distanced, of course. Okay. Um, College applications for the early cycle. Okay, excited about being with this group. Worried about all the teams and Zoom meetings. Um, since I'm quarantined, I'm excited to be able to FaceTime and play NBA 2K. I hear you. I'm excited to be a part of the group today. Excited to go to school for a band sectional, and my sports season starts soon. Awesome. All right, let's take about 10 more, 10 or 15 more seconds on this. If you have a, an answer that you want to, you want to get in there. All right, worried about the number of COVID cases increasing. Um, I think I have what they call COVID fatigue. I hear you, definitely. I think many of us can relate. Um, <laughs> so test anxiety, potentially. Exc excited to get it over with. Um, and finally get to swim for the first time in a few months. That must be uh, really, really exciting for you. Awesome. All right, let's go on. All right. How can this um, last one for a little while, and then I'm going to introduce you to some some different strategies. But how can this advisory support one another socially and or emotionally? How can you support one another? And that goes for um, again for everybody and everybody on the call. You know, it's not just kids supporting kids. It's also adults supporting kids and adults supporting one another. How can how can we support one another socially and or emotionally? during this time. Tony, I forgot to start my timer. I apologize. I'll try and be super quick. All right. So providing resources to each other. Hello? We're a group. We are in this together. Is that Dr. Woods Tucker, maybe? Um, being respectful of everyone's perspectives and thinking, not being judgmental. Yes, that's so important. Um, being able to really listen to one another, that's an important skill. It's awesome. What else can we do to, to support one another? Um, socially, we can share things that are happening in our lives and help us get through it. Um, we can simply be there for each other, be respectful and open to listen to everyone. Um, keep in contact, so important. Um, all right, being able to relate to one another, regular check-ins that are anonymous to evaluate capacity for work and mental health. Absolutely, um, I hear that. Listening to all uh, that the others have to say, actually perceiving what they are trying to say. So um, so kind of a judgment-free zone, just really trying to be an active listener to understand the other person's perspective. Um, creating a space for students to rant. Okay, I hear you. Um, consistency, interacting in the group me. So. Um, so that's something that the group needs to work on. Um, okay. 
All right. We can continue to establish a personal connection with the other members of the advisory. And I, I would say that for, for everybody here, you know, um, we can, we can all uh, work in different capacities. We can go to school to different schools throughout the state, um, but we've really got to, we've really got to find ways to connect um, personally, because when we connect personally, I think that's when um, we're able to produce our best, um, our best stuff. All right. So, I want to give you um, some coping strategies um, that I want you to kind of take with you. I want you to think about if something resonates with you. I'm going to give you like 20, 30 cards real quick. They're going to just fly by. But if something resonates with you, I just want you to hold on because I want you to tell us um, why that resonated with you later on. And then I also want you to think about a strategy. Um, out of all the strategies, I just want you to take one with you back to your school or community to help those that you um, you attend school with, those that teach you, et cetera. All right, so here we go. All right, so it's really important, um, especially when we feel stressed and anxious, that we just pause and take some slow, deep breaths. Um, so normally we tell people to put a hand on their chest and a hand on their belly and um, inhale three times, um, inhale uh, deeply and then exhale deeply three times. Okay, so that's just one strategy. Um, it may not seem like it now, but this feeling will eventually pass. It will not last forever. So a lot of times we get stuck in our anxiety or um, some of that stress, and that's all we can see. We can't see beyond it, but we've got to remind ourselves that um, that it will not. That stress, that anxiety, will not last forever. Um, resist the urge to isolate. Um, reach out to a friend or family member. I may not feel like doing this right now, but I know that I usually feel better after I do this. So it's easy right now to just kind of hole up at home and, and just isolate yourself. But um, again, that connection you guys talked about earlier, that connection is super important for all of us. So even when we're not feeling up to it, we've got to reach out um, and create that. All right, think about this. What am I worrying about? How likely is this to occur and evaluate the evidence? I don't know about you, but I get caught up in, in worrying about what's what's going to happen um, without really having evidence that that's ever happened before. OK, so really we really need to kind of ask ourselves these questions and then evaluate the evidence of the likelihood that that's going to actually occur. All right. If I find myself focusing on negatives, I can counter this by identifying and writing down three to five positive things. Um, again, positive things may include what went well today, things I'm grateful for, things I'm looking forward to. Really try to start waking up um, every day and just say, you know, these are three things that I'm grateful for. And that's really helped my outlook for the entire day. Um, change is hard, but it's worth it. OK, change is hard but it's worth it. All right, so we've got to remind ourselves of that. Making a mistake does not mean that I'm a failure. Everyone makes mistakes. Again, we talk about trying to create that perfect image for the world. Um, and sometimes we do it so much so that we forget ourselves that we're not perfect and that everyone makes mistakes. So at those times when that happens, we've got to remind ourselves that everyone makes mistakes and, and I do too, and that's okay. Um, zoom out, look at the whole picture. OK, again, it's really easy to get super specific and hone in on one thing that's not going well in your life. But if we zoom out and look at the whole picture, we'll find that there are a lot of things that are going really well. Um, we just have a, we might be suffering in one small area, one isolated area. All right. One relaxation technique is called visual imagery. You can kind of close your eyes and imagine yourself in a calm, peaceful setting. Many of you, many of you folks um, love the beach, so you can imagine yourself um, with toe with your toes in the sand and hearing the waves in the background and just really try and um, visualize that beach. All right, resist urges to avoid anxiety provoking situations. So it's easy for us to say, man, I do not like how this friendship is going and I need to say something, but that's uncomfortable, so I'm not gonna say anything. Or um, I, I really felt like there was a microaggression at work or something like that. Um, and I know I need to say something, but it's easier to avoid it. So resist that urge to avoid that that anxiety provoking situation. And remember that avoidance may seem like an effective short term strategy, but it maintains and worsens your anxiety over time. OK, so we've got to kind of confront things as they come. Um, the only way out is through face it and work through it in order to gain control over it. Again, don't put things aside. OK, we can go through them. 
Um, Self-criticism doesn't help. It just contributes to the problem by making me feel worse. I will try to respond to my self-critical thoughts with self-compassion. This is one of the biggest things that I worry about as a, as a school counselor for many of our kids. Many of our kids um, think of themselves as unworthy, right? Unlove, unlovable. Um, um, not as smart as they are, not as beautiful as they are. And we've got to get past that. And we've got to realize that telling ourselves those nasty things and having that negative self-talk is not healthy at all. All right, let it go. I will let go of anything that no longer serves me. Okay. Is telling yourself these negative things about yourself serving you and where you want to go in your life. All right. Change can be scary, but the alternative is staying stuck. I choose change. I deserve to be happy. It seems really simple, but I would suggest to you that many people don't feel like they deserve to be happy. Okay. But we all do. Um, stop focusing on the past. I can shift my attention to the present by practicing a mindfulness exercise. Okay. I think that mindfulness should be in every school all the time because it's got benefits that help every student and the adults in the building. All right. So really, um, that might be one thing that you advocate in your, your school setting. Perfect is impossible. Remember to set reasonable goals. Otherwise, I will inevitably be disappointed and unsatisfied. All right. Um, challenge all or nothing thinking. Find the shades of gray between the black and white. Okay. I'm not going to win every game, but I'm going to win some of them. Okay. And I'm going to work hard to win as many as I can. This storm will pass. Panic attack tip. Write it out. Label what I'm experiencing as anxiety. Accept it. Do not fight it or try to control it. Use grounding, grounding techniques. Remember that this will not last forever. It is unpleasant, but it will eventually pass. And then here are some grounding techniques. Look around, identify, and name five things that you see, four things that you physically feel, three things that you hear, two things you smell, and one thing you taste. Um, remember that progress is not linear. There's no straight line to, to progress, right? It's kind of that roller coaster. Um, so be patient and don't give up. All right, I will not let my past define me. I will try to observe my thoughts without judgment. Okay, we judge ourselves way too often and that's gotta stop. Um, use a healthy coping strategy. Just go out for a walk during the day. Write in, a, write in a journal, spend time coloring. I do this with my five-year-old twins all the time. And then meditate and listen to music. Um, tough days don't erase the progress that you've made. Reduce physical vulnerability to overwhelming emotions by prioritizing balanced eating and balanced sleeping habits. And sometimes it's really, really important for you to just get on that bike or go to that gym if it's socially distanced and healthy and and, um, and they're taking all precautions, um, just to make sure that you're getting the exercise you need as well. All right. It is okay to ask for help. Again, this can be from an adult. This can be between adults. This can be between students. It's okay to ask for help. This can also be for, from, a, from a caregiver. And, and then just this is something I, I was really thinking about this morning. This is the time to check on an old friend, right? So we really worry about students that might feel isolated and might not really have a lot of connections, social connections. So this is the time. If you are just, it, maybe you weren't an old friend. Maybe it's somebody that you, you've seen around the building and they just kind of always seem to be by themselves. This is the time to walk up, introduce yourself, and just check on them. How you doing? You know, um, this, my name's Damien. I'd love to know a little bit more about you. All right, so um, so finishing up today's activity, based on some of the things you've heard today, is there anything new that you are willing to try when feeling stressed, anxious, lonely, or isolated? So what's one takeaway from today's quick coping strategies that you might be willing to try? Go ahead and enter that. One thing you might be willing to, to give a shot. All right, the five, four, three, two, one method. Absolutely. That that's a grounding technique. It's awesome. What else? Could you reach out to that friend? Could you be more balanced with your um, with your own health? Could you be less judge judgmental of yourself? All right, breathing techniques. Willing to try some breathing techniques. Thinking of several positive aspects of my life to focus on. Absolutely. Right. 
we hone it, we tend to hone in or um, to, to zoom in on those negative aspects of our lives, but we forget about the positive ones. Very good. Uh, more healthy distractions, walking, breathing, reflecting. Awesome. Okay. Self-compassion is much more important than self-criticism. All right. Um, I also appreciate the reminder that I need to focus on positive things in your life. Very good. Okay, open up to old friends and checking in. Um, stopping to visualize a peaceful situation. If you would, please leave a message. And then remembering and reassuring yourself that the stress you are feeling won't last forever. All right, very good. All right. Um, real quick, answer this question for us. This will help KDE. I feel that my school community is... Do you feel like they are very, your school community is very positive, somewhat positive, neutral, struggling, or disconnected? All right, so I'm seeing a lot of, I'm seeing, okay, so we've got somewhat positive. Um, we've got a few that are um, very positive. We've got some that are neutral, we've got a few that are struggling, and we've got a few that are disconnected, okay? Um, but mostly we're seeing somewhat positive. Um, next, we're seeing neutral as the, the next highest answer, and then struggling, then disconnected, and lastly, we see very positive. All right, last question. Based on some of the strategies we've discussed today, what is one thing you can take back and share with your school community? All right, so we see you at KDE. We see we see the kids on the call as true leaders of your school community, people that can create change wherever you are. Um, so what is one thing that you can take back and you can share with your school community to, that says, you know, we, we want our students to have this one strategy or this one skill? Ask question. All right, feeling that it won't last forever. Very good. What else we got? I can share with others the importance of resisting urge to isolate, especially in these times. Yes, so important. How cool would it be um, if you're back in person and as a school leader, like I mentioned, um, if you asked your principal if you were allowed to, to give one strategy, maybe one strategy a week, right? Um, one of the strategies you see on your screen this morning, advocating for people to reach out and get, get help, okay? Uh, you deserve to be happy. Change is worth it. Reflect. A bad day does not erase the progress you have made. I love that one, too. Um, things will get better. Go slow. Success is defined by your own terms. Um, the only way forward is through it. I don't think it was a strategy, but I think normalizing stress and anxiety is necessary, okay? All right. The storm will pass. All right. Very good. Um, again, thank you for participating with me. Um, you are absolutely my favorite group to, to work with. So appreciate your time this morning. Thanks. Thank you, Damian. We appreciate you uh, coming in. The kids absolutely love, they request you every meeting. So um, <laughs> wanted to um, appreciate the time. I think that we've got Dr. Woods Tucker on now. We were having some audio technicality difficulties here. I was just going to just do a, a quick test. Dr. Woods Tucker, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Great, great. All right, so that, that leads us into our next agenda item. Uh, Commissioner Glass. Hey, Thomas, great to hear from you. How's it going, sir? Great to hear from you and see so many uh, intriguing, smiling, beautiful faces this morning. This is what it's about. Yeah, well, we're delighted that you could be with us as well. Uh, the students wanted to talk a little bit about equity and uh, anti-racism efforts. And um, I thought we might start out uh, with me just asking um, asking you a couple of questions, and then we turn it over um, to you for some of your thoughts. And then we just have the students have a conversation with you. Does that sound okay? Sounds great to me. All right. So, um uh, this is your first meeting with the group, but maybe you can tell, just tell the folks some about uh, about your background and, and um, uh, story. Absolutely. I have been uh, a career uh, educator for 30 years. I've been a classroom teacher. I've been an athletic coach, an assistant principal, director of curriculum, and superintendent. And I always uh, valued the power 
of public education and the role it plays in democracy. And to me, a, a strong public education system is the backbone of our great democracy. Now, with that said, the public education system has not always been open to everyone. I graduated, uh, you, you're going to find out how old I am. I, gra I uh, started school in, um, in the early 70s. And even in the early 70s, my elementary school, this was uh, in the South, it was still a segregated school. But we had great teachers, great teachers who believed in us, uh, great administrators and a strong community that believed in us, uh, that regardless of our background, that if we work together to remove many of these barriers, we still could be successful. So I've dedicated, uh, Dr. Glass and our students and our folks here in the Commonwealth, I've dedicated my life to removing many of these barriers. I felt uh, the sting of inequality, inequities, and racism. I was born in 1965, and if not for the 1960, the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, I would not have been allowed here in these United States. Uh, the greatest country in the world would not have been allowed to be born in a hospital. And so I felt it, and I've dealt with it from uh, the time I was born until, quite frankly, uh, when I've been an adult. But I still believe, and I hold in my heart, our best vehicle for eradicating inequalities and racism is a strong public education system. <clears throat> Thomas, tell us about, um, you know, shifting to the work that, that you have ahead of you. Um, and, and Thomas is, uh, is, is, isn't even officially started with the Department of Education yet, so we appreciate him being on with us early. Uh, he, he starts with us officially next week. But what are some of the ideas that you have around what, what are the elements of a statewide anti-racism equity effort? What are the ingredients of this that, uh, that, that we will be working on and thinking about? Well, I think we've started first and foremost with uh, Commissioner Glass with your commitment and the commitment with the board of Ed, with the uh, state board of education to have a resolution that is committed to equity i think that's where it starts and then we need to ensure that we're living out that creed in our public school system and tell me about what are what are some of the first steps so you and i are going to get together uh, next week socially distance and masks everybody yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, Dr. Woods Tucker and I are going to talk some about, um, you know, how we're going to go about this work. But what do you think some of the first steps on this work around anti-racism and equity? What, what are the first things you think you're going to do? Well, first, I need to spend some time finding out what's happening in the Commonwealth already, because I'm certain that there are some great things that are already happening um, in the school system. And then look at some of the best practices across the country. So yeah, this, and, and listen to our students and staff, you know, listen to the great ideas that they have as well. Um, and and um, just so everybody knows, uh, Dr. Woods Tucker is also going to be the deputy commissioner over the division of teaching and learning uh, or over the office of teaching and learning here at the department. And so it's a great combination of a focus on equity with also uh, being the person who's really sort of the chief academic officer for the state as well. Um, students, let me turn things over to you and see what questions or thoughts or comments you have. Advice for Dr. Woods Tucker as he gets started in, in uh, Kentucky, you've heard him say that he's most interested in understanding what's going on and, and some of the perspectives here um, and uh, and, and getting really taking that effort to f seek first to understand um, as he comes in into Kentucky. So what's some feedback or questions you might have for him? And students, I know several of you all, when we polled you all, there was, I mean, out of, I think, 27 of you, 18 of you wanted to wanted to hear more about this uh, topic. So I see a couple of hands. And if you want to take a, a moment to introduce yourself to Dr. Woods Tucker, I'm sure he would love to hear a little bit more about what district you're from, uh, and maybe just a little bit brief introduction about yourself. I think that would be helpful as well. We'll start with Sophie. Go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, Tony, looks like Thomas has something he wants to say. Just to oh, gotcha. yeah. I want to give them 35 seconds, 40 seconds to formulate their questions. And I'm going to grab some water so we can have right at it. Okay. We can go right at it. Does that Perfect. sound good? 
Thumbs Perfect. up. Thumbs up. And I see about six or seven hands up. So you, you're go get go. Get water. <laughs> and then Dr. Glass, while he's going to get his water, I wanted to let you know that right after this, we did have a little uh, added agenda item on our world language. So we have, which we thought was a good, uh, our world language standards, we thought was a good um, add in. Uh, we have a couple of members from the OTL team um, because those are going to be going to the board in December, and they were really, really hoping to get some um, student feedback on that. So we're going to spend just a few minutes uh, right after that while we have Dr. Tucker with us. Um, I believe Aaron, um, I'm not sure who's on. I'll check here in just a second. But uh, after this little discussion um, here, we'll and before we go to the next agenda item, we'll uh, talk a little bit about world language standards, if that's okay with you. Sure. Perfect. All right, first up, we'll go with Sophie. Sophie Farmer. Hi, um, I'm Sophie Farmer. I'm a senior at the Gatton Academy, but I'm from Danville, um, so the Central Kentucky area. And I was really curious kind of what the Department of Education um, wants to do with a historically accurate curriculum. And if that's something that you're interested in pursuing to kind of work on anti-racist education and making sure that all of our curriculum reflects all of our students. Yeah. Sophie, that's a beautifully articulated question. Uh, and as Dr. Glass said, I'll have the privilege of not only being the chief equity officer, but also collaborating with our folks in teaching and learning. And I think that's going to be a beautiful marriage because we can look at uh, curriculum with an equity lens to ensure that all of our students, all of the students uh, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, that your experiences, our adult experiences, are reflected in the curriculum. And that doesn't happen. I mean, I, I was really intrigued uh, by that to have an opportunity to uh, look at the equity work that we're going to do and combine it with the teaching and learning, the curriculum, because that's really at the heart of what we do. And to ensure that this beautiful mosaic uh, that I'm looking at right now, that is reflected in our day-to-day -day curriculum. Great. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, we'll go next with Anna. Anna is in Anderson County. Good morning, everyone. Um, Dr. Woods Tucker, it's Good very morning. nice to um, meet you finally. Um, I'm excited to hear more from you. Um, so my question, it's my last year in high school, and I have used my career to basically get involved in academics and leadership positions just to allow people to see that minorities can do that. Um, I'm at home, so I can't really do that in the school system now, but I was just wondering what I can do from home to make sure that that equity um, just perspective is trans, um, transformed, or not transformed, but transitioned into my school system while I'm at home. Well, Anna, you're doing the first and most important thing. You're not on the sideline, you're actively engaged. Even though we're in this era of COVID, this era of, of this Zoom boom and Microsoft Teams, you're actively having a voice to help shape the present and future learning experience uh, for young folks uh, and our staff members in uh, the Commonwealth of Kentucky. So the first thing uh, is to get off, we need to get off the sideline and we're off and you're definitely and all your colleagues are off the sideline. You're engaged you're involved and you're making sure that your voices are being heard. And then the second thing, Anna, we need to make sure that we hold folks accountable, that we do what we say we're gonna do and we say what we're gonna do. And that's tough work. It is tough. It's tough holding people uh, accountable, holding, and it starts with holding yourself accountable. But this is important work. Our future, the future of Kentucky, the future of, the, of, of uh, this nation is in your hands. Looks like you're muted, Tony. Good, then I did not interrupt. I was hoping, <laughs> good, that was not as awkward as I thought it was. <laughs> so thank you. We'll go next with Logan. Logan's in Fayette County. Hello, Mr. Tucker. Um, I first want to say congratulations. I'm super excited that, you know, we're adding this position to the Kentucky um, Department of Education. Um, and I just wanted to say that the story that you, you know, told us in the beginning, it was very inspiring to show, um, you know, that minorities, they're, they're just as equal and just as, you know, prominent um, in our school system as others. 
And so what I would suggest um, doing is maybe make a video with that like really inspiring story um, and to kind of broadcast to our students to show, you know, it's everybody is able to do that. You, you know, does that make sense? Um, I hope that came across, you know, clearly. But I think that's just such an inspiring story to share. Yeah. And, and Logan, thank you for saying that I, there is, and, and I'll work, um, you know, with our partners at KDE to sort of get out um, a, a video that I did a couple years ago. I haven't had a whole lot of success just doing stuff by myself. It's been with great students. It's been with great, uh, great leaders, great staff. And um, I was fortunate um, to be recognized by two great organizations for the work I've been able to do with teams of folks and students. And so it sort of tells my story. And uh, and I'm an open person. You know, I was um, I have a group text with my brothers and they're all over the country. And I, I have four brothers. Now I did have five. And we were talking about our history and we were looking at each other's and, and, and my stories, folks. So please don't take that. My story is only unique to me. It's unique to each one of you. Every person in this, in this country here uh, has a story to tell, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your sexual orientation, regardless of your social economic background. And I'm really excited to talk with you all about expanding what diversity looks like because it's more than just the color of skin. But Logan, uh, to wrap up the story here in about 35 seconds, uh, each one of us, uh, each of my brothers and I were showing uh, snippets of our birth certificates. And it was difficult seeing all of them being born on the, on our farm with the, with the midwife, with an outstanding midwife. And as I said earlier, if the laws have not changed, and we need people like you all here in 2020 and beyond to continue to push the envelope and change laws. But if the laws had not changed, if I had just been born a few months earlier in 64, not in 65, my birth certificate would have said the same thing on a farm with a midwife. And so we need you all more than ever because we've made a lot of progress with equity. We made a whole lot of progress, but there is so much more to go. And as a 55 year old man, I've felt the sting of it. So no one uh, is immune to the sting of inequities and folks simply not being kind. Thank you, Logan, um, for that question. And also, I want to give a shout out to Logan. Logan has a, um, he has a, I, you, maybe you want to be, invite Dr. Woods Tucker um, to your podcast. I think that would be a great opportunity. Uh, Logan has a podcast, and I think that would be, maybe you maybe send an invitation and, and talk a little bit further. As you all know, I, I believe in the power of storytelling and and love to tell your all stories, but Dr. Woods Tucker does have an incredible story and we will absolutely work um, with our video team and, and continue to tell his story because I think that many of you can see yourselves uh, in different ways in, in his story and in different stories of all of us at the Department of Education. So thank you for that question, Logan. Uh, next, let's go to Kate. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say thank you and I'd love to do that, Mr. Tucker, if you'd be willing sure. to. Absolutely. Great. Um, our next, let's go to Cade. Cade Scott. Hi. Uh, I just want to ask, um, what advice would you offer about addressing students who hold racist uh, misconceptions or who say racist things? Cade, it has to be, it, it starts, and we're going to speak uh, in, in a building, right? You meaning in a building or in society? Or is there any specific place? Well, so I would say normally in a building, like in a traditional school year, but now it's kind of transitioned online. Like it's still there online. Yeah, yeah. And, and Kate, the online education we're receiving is still considered, doesn't look like it, doesn't fully feel like it, but it's still part of the regular school. It starts with the culture of the building leadership. It starts with the power of staff 
and the power of students being fearless, but fearless in a very non-confrontational way to confront bullying. If you don't stop, if you don't confront bullying, if you don't confront sexism and racism, it will continue to permeate your society. It will continue to permeate your school. So it starts with everyone in the school creating a culture and buying into the culture that that's not going to be tolerated. And you have to be fearless. And uh, it's tough. Let me tell you, it is. I, I've been in some places where it's been very difficult. I've been in some places where uh, we, we, we've done some great work. We were very successful. But I left because we could not change the culture. And the culture was not right for me. And more importantly, it wasn't right for students and staff. So it starts with being fearless and, and hoping that you're in a culture that em, embraces equity, that embraces differences. Okay. All right. I appreciate that's a great question, Cade. Uh, next question, let's go to Sam, Sam Smith. Hello, my name is Sam Smith. I'm from Davis County. Uh, my question, and it kind of goes off of what Cade said, was what happens when the teachers are becoming, like, are racist? Like, I, I had a personal incident where one of my teachers made a very racist comment on like stereotypical on just, you know, whatever. And I just, how do you go about reporting that? Cause when I tried calling her out or tried discussing it to other teachers, they make excuses almost. She's the leader of FCA. She does this, she does that. She can't be racist. And it was a very, you know, uh, Sam, uh, as a, you know, as a as a student, as a teacher, a young adult, and even as a as a superintendent, I've had to deal with that. And and we have uh, people who are insensitive and may not be the kindest folks, even in professional, even in in education. You would think that this would be the place where you would have the most respectful uh, folks, folks who would be kind to everyone. I think you, you start with having a conversation as a student with that teacher and you ask him or her uh, to please explain in a very positive professional way that belief. And that person owes that explanation to the entire class if this is said to the entire class. And if that teacher cannot take care of that, you know, to your you know, satisfaction, you need to then go to his or her principal. There are also uh, superintendents, as you know, and there's board policy that govern, uh, board policy uh, really governs how people should behave. And I can tell you right now, uh, racism is not one of those policies that boards hold up. And so there is recourse, but the conversation first begins with that teacher and with your parents. So please, please, I trust, Sam, that you brought your parents into the conversation as well. And you had an opportunity. So you bring your parents in, in the conversation, have a conversation with the teacher and let this teacher know how you and, and your classmates felt. Again, this is about bringing awareness and consciousness, because apparently in the past, there were students who did not uh, even call the teacher out or the administrator out on some of these racist things. And it's happening. I mean, it's 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 you know, we have almost 400 years of public education and um, we've had to deal with still the best education public education system in the world. But it's some of these challenges. And I ask that you all really challenge our classroom teachers, support staff and administrators to have a more inclusive culture. Thomas, if I could um, build on that, I think. It, this is a, a it's a it's a troubling story or question that that Sam raises, but also it raises up for me that 
all of us throughout life has have an obligation to remain learners. Um, and uh, if you have a, if there's a teacher that it expresses something that is racist or offensive, uh, it could be that that's really what's in their heart. But it also could be that they they need somebody to um, challenge them on that and give them the opportunity to reflect and learn and grow. And I think that's part of what um, Dr. Woods Tucker is is saying in that in that conversation. What did you mean by that? Um, it helped me explain. That gives that t- the teacher an opportunity to reflect back and think about how did their words impact others, or how did that come off. And then, I, you know, Dr. Tucker is also right. If that doesn't work, uh, there are policies and laws against racist practices in education that are in every school district in the state. And so, I, you know, I think you start with with uh, trying trying to help someone grow and learn. Um, and if that doesn't work, we we just cannot tolerate someone who has that in their heart being in the profession. I also wanted to um, see if Todd is is Todd Allen by chance in our meeting today. I was going to check. I know he was in here, here early. Todd, would you mind just I you know I just want to make sure because this is obviously a, a big concern obviously to us at the department and, and is a concern to our schools. I just wanted to see, and I'm going to post in the chat too. I want all of our students and those that are listening to know that this is something that we we do not tolerate in our schools and in the Commonwealth. Can you just kind of go over the um, the EPSB? You know what what happens if this does not what you do not what we can do from a standpoint if this is not handled at the school level, uh, in particular, if this is something that's happening in our classrooms. Would you mind sharing that? Sure. So all um, teachers in Kentucky and Kentucky public schools are required to have what we call a certificate, which is essentially their license to be a teacher. Um, I'm an attorney. I have to have a license to be an attorney, and many professional careers require licenses to perform your job, and teachers in public schools is one of them. The Education Professional Standards Board, or EPSB, is the entity that issues these certificates to teachers, and they're also responsible for ensuring that teachers comply with the Code of Ethics um, in order to keep their teaching certificate. So uh, we receive complaints here at the department for the EPSB to review. Um, You know, we receive many of them every year that the EPSB takes up. If there are allegations that a teacher has done something to violate the code of ethics, then the EPSB will review that and determine whether or not uh, there's some type of disciplinary action that should be taken against the teacher's certificate. Um, And that could range from a lot of things. It could uh, mean that the teacher needs to have some training um, to move forward. Um, In very egregious situations, it could mean that the teacher loses his or her license or certificate to be a teacher. Those are the, the much more extreme circumstances. But in any event, uh, the important thing for you to know is, first of all, that superintendents in every school district have a duty to report to EPSB anytime they have reason to believe that a teacher has violated the code of ethics so that the EPSB can review that to determine whether action is necessary. But the EPSB also receives complaints from um, community members, whether it's parents, students, um, other certified educators, or even classified staff within a school building who witness something that has happened that's alleged um, to be a violation of the code of ethics. So if you have any information like that and um, you or someone you know wants to make a complaint to the EPSB, you can reach out to us. We can provide you with the detailed information um, and we can also provide you with a copy of the code of ethics that all teachers uh, are required to comply with. Thank you, Todd. I just wanted to make sure you all know that because we do we do try to um, let our community and our public know about that, but a lot of people don't uh, necessarily know that information. So, all right, going back to um, our students, um, Miles McGinnis, you're next. Can you all hear me? I can. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Oh shoot! Uh, can anyone see me? Yes, there okay. you are. I can see all you. Right. All right, so my question is, uh, in public schools, we often see a learning deficit between blacks and white kids. Uh, When it comes to academics, how can we address that and encourage ways to flatten that curve? Oh, Miles, I really, really love that question. I love all the questions, so you're going to hear me say all morning. I love those questions. It is not an intellectual deficit an intellectual gap. It is an, what we call an opportunity gap. 
the issue is how do we provide opportunities to poor students and students who may not have the means due to systemic racism. And let's just call it what it is, because if you have a group of people who have not had opportunities to access higher education, which is one of the necessities, which is a, a huge step that you can take to get a higher paying job, then if you don't have those funds, you're not going to have the opportunities to purchase a home, have home ownership in a neighborhood or in a city or community where there are high quality schools and you have high quality teachers, high quality superintendents, administrators, and support staff. So I challenge us going forward, how do we, one, as we talked about, Sam and others talked about, confronting racism and bigotry, and how do we build opportunities for students, male, female, of all ethnicities, of all different backgrounds, all different persuasions? How do we continue to fight these, these evils uh, that result from racism and, and uh, systemic racism and historic racism so that folks have opportunities to be gainfully employed and make a salary to provide opportunities for their children? So it's about providing opportunities. And, and I know the work that Dr. Glass is going to do He's going to make sure we're going to make sure that we have a very enriched curriculum in every school that every student in the Commonwealth has access to. And we need to also focus on ensuring that our schools have adequate funding so we can provide additional opportunities like internships that students from uh, historically um, uh, you know, uh, low low performing backgrounds wouldn't necessarily have, not because they didn't have the intellectual ability, but because they simply didn't have the opportunities. Their moms and dads were not as connected as, say, some other ethnic groups. Okay, great. Good question, uh, Miles. I appreciate the question and the feedback. Uh, let's go down to Marshall County, Jack Johnson. I am a Judge Johnson. I'm a sophomore in Marshall County, and I go to a very rural school. Um, and there's about 1,400 kids that go to my school, and there is probably less than one percent um, of my school that does not identify with the Caucasian um, ethnicity or race. Uh, so, what can I do in my community to help stabilize that and help you know um, kind of get rid of the racism that I see? every day. Well, first, Jack, thanks for recognizing it. Uh, I'm a country boy, too. I'm from Arkansas. I grew up in a small place called Cotton Plant, Arkansas. So uh, I, I, I certainly um, understand, and I've lived in the, in, in the middle-sized cities and big cities. But when you start to look at this lack of diversity in our rural areas, you've taken the first step. One, you've recognized it. I don't know, Jack, have you all created any clubs for students, uh, mentor clubs? Let's say where you as a sophomore, you could mentor, let's say a, a, a student whose ethnicity uh, is different than yours, whose sexual orientation is different than yours or economic background is different than yours. Uh, you could then uh, mentor that student and help that student become a part of your school culture to learn, because the big thing is about, it's really about learning the school culture, learning the norms, the things to do and not to do in the school and learning how the school operates. So one, uh, I would create some type of cultural, uh, if you don't have one, a cultural diversity club, uh, where we one, provide support for students who are different than, uh, who, are, who are different than, um, than the, uh, traditional students, if you will, and I would um, uh, mentor those students. I, and, and you know what, Jack, that works in every setting. I've been able to be a part of groups in elementary, middle, high school, and in college. 
So when we switch late on in the year, we talk about now, how do we, uh, uh, Jack, in a couple of years, you'll be looking at, you know, you'll be a senior, you know, how can I further this in college? And I can give you some ideas of how important mentorship is in college, but I would start with confronting it and uh, setting up mentor programs. Do you have a mentorship program in your school? Um, so what we do, I'm part of the leadership class uh, for my school, and we're very active uh, in our elementary and our middle schools, and I actually mentor for middle schoolers, but it's not specifically towards um, diversity. So do you suggest that I type that in as a recommendation, like I want to mentor a certain student? Because we usually go by class, and we help the teacher, and we're just a very uh, – a very positive presence in the classroom and that's what we consider our mentoring um but what do you suggest i think that's a good that's a good start but i would bring other like-minded students with you and look for a faculty or staff representative because that sends the message we talked about uh staff members are not always sensitive i would like to think 99.9 percent of them are so i would find a staff member i don't know if you have a staff sponsor bring that idea to the staff and then bring that idea uh, to your counseling staff and then ultimately to the administration. All uh, right. Um, I think I have, I think I have the uh, necessary details to take the next step. So thank you. Sure. And Jack, this is a great opportunity for you. Um, you know, we talk about with this particular advisory council and, and action plans, you know, let's, you know, work amongst your peers on this group and, and how, um, you know, I know that we've talked and I know Caleb has worked on some things and um, I know that there's some similar ideas. Um, I think Cade has talked about similar things, you know, talk, talk to us and how we can help you at the department and support you um, in this venture of yours. We'd, we'd love to help you with that. Thank you very much. Absolutely. All right, Drake. Callaway County, correct? Am I right? Am I right, Callaway? Am I getting them right? Yes. Um <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dr. Woods Tucker. I'm a sophomore at Callaway County High School in District 1, and I was wondering what are some specific things we as students can do in our schools and within our families to ensure that we are combating racism and elevating equity? Well, first and foremost, um, I really believe students, the, the ideas that you all are generating, I think we, if we come together, we can share some of those ideas, and some of those ideas may be more effective than some of the things that uh, I come up with. Uh, but I can certainly share with you uh, some things that I've seen successful over the last 30-plus uh, years in terms of combating racism. Again, it starts uh, at the very top. I mean, we're fortunate. Every state or commonwealth has not put forth an equity statement every school district has not put forth an equity statement. So I would ask, uh, you know, my building principals and, and teachers, does the district or the building, does that, you know, does the district have an equity statement? Do you know whether or not there's an equity statement that uh, you all have been committed to? I know the, the Commonwealth, the, the Department of Education has issued one, but I would ask, what is the school district's equity statement on top of what of the Commonwealth has done. And two, I would continue, like I said with uh, Jack, work with those groups. Student, you're probably involved in student government. You're probably involved in other leadership groups. Bring those things to light because, again, uh, uh, only light can bring light. Darkness will only bring in darkness. So we need to bring these things here to light. And we need to make sure that we have a comfortable environment and you need to be comfortable and your classmates need to be comfortable bringing these things to light. So uh, helping the school create a, a culture. One of the things that I um, really have taken to heart over the last several years is the power of the student voice. And this is what Commissioner Glass is giving you all, the power of your voice. He's harnessing the power of your voice. Students, the change is in your hands. Our adults, we need to facilitate the change and give you some ideas and, and support you and help create a vision. But your voice is the is one of the, if not the most powerful voice we have. Thank you. Sure. 
I was mute. I yeah. muted myself again. Sorry. <laughs> um, we will go next to uh, Soyana. So um, Dr. Woods Tucker, just a little uh, note on Soyana. She's from Louisville and she was just appointed. She is our first ever um, student representative on the Kentucky Board of Education. So just a little background on that. Uh, she just attended her first meeting. So Soyana. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Soliana, and I'm a junior at Eastern High School in Louisville, Kentucky. And my question is, can you distinguish the difference between equity and equality in school? How do we make sure educators understand the difference? And how is that difference significant in our schools? Okay, uh, three big questions, three beautiful, imp uh, important questions. And so I'm going to have to dissect each one of them. And so you have to Feed me a little bit at a time. Equity and equality. And I've been studying this this for a long time. I've, again, this is a old fellow that's been around for a while. Equality simply means I'm going to give everybody the same thing. But guess what? Is it Soliana? Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes. Guess what? You may not need the same thing as Miles. You may not need the same thing as Sam. You may not need the same thing as Logan. You may, may not need the same thing as Amy because each one of us is unique individuals, created as unique individuals. So think about equity as giving everybody the same thing. I'm going to give everyone, you know, when I was a kid, I would, uh, you know, I would say, I'm going to give everyone 50 cents. Now times have changed. I'm going to say, I'm going to give everyone $5. Just giving everyone five dollars. Well, you may not need the same thing as five dollars, but equity is giving our folks what they need. Because again, we're created as unique individuals, giving folks what they need to be successful and to grow into competent, thriving young adults. Now, what's the second part of your question? How do we make sure that, you know, students, parents, and educators know that difference? We have to teach it. As uh, Dr. Glass said earlier, we have a commitment in the Commonwealth that this is something that we value, and you just cannot talk about it. You know, I've, I've been in places where we just talked about it. We just talked about um, the importance of equity. We just talked about the importance of diversity. And the only time we really celebrated was, you know, February during Black History Month or uh, another month when we celebrated other ethnicities or we had, uh, a, you know, Pride Month. But we have to really live it. We just can't give lip service to it. We have to really live it. It has to be a creed that we're going to live out. And when, I, when we walk into a building, we walk into an organization, we should see things that will clearly say, we value equity. We value uh, equity across ethnicities. We value uh, equality, ensuring that folks have what they need and we need to give to ensure everyone has a That's a good example. Every kid, every student, I should say, should have a laptop. We give every student a laptop. But what uh, specific courses students may take or need, that would be different. So I could walk into a building and I should see those types of things. And the third part of your question. Uh, I, feel, I feel like you kind of touched on it. It's how, how, um, how significant the difference is. Yeah. Yeah. We have to embrace it, young lady. We have to embrace it and hold each other accountable. And as I said a few minutes ago, holding folks accountable, that's, that's difficult work. That's a very, very heavy lift. But, I would much rather engage in that difficulty of living that out than just saying this is important to us. Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks Thomas. Uh, Soliana is our student representative on the State Board of Education, so uh, she you'll get a chance to work with her even more in that capacity. Very good. Oh, muted, Tony. But muted again. Sorry. I'm just so in, I'm. You know, I love you all. I break on you all so much. I just don't want to uh, interrupt any of anything you're having to say. We'll go next to um, Caleb. Caleb Bates, breath it. 
Yeah, so I'm Caleb Bates, and I'm a senior at Brenton High School in Jackson, Kentucky. Uh, first of all, I want to say good morning to everyone, and I want to welcome you, Dr. Woods Tucker. Thank you. I'm really grateful to have you here. So I actually have a couple thoughts, and then I have a question. So first of all, um, you know, Logan mentioned how inspirational your story was, and I really appreciate you, um, especially you, know, you sharing that. And then Sophie mentioned the importance of historically accurate social studies standards. And that's something that I really care about. Um, you know, working to teach landmark um, events such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that you mentioned in your story. And then also going beyond that and sh um, showcasing how racism still exists in systems today. Um, you know, my community here in Breathitt County is 96.44, roughly 96.4 percent, um, according to the census the last time that I checked. Um, white only, according to the terminology of the census. Um, and I feel like we're isolated here right now. So sometimes we don't always experience things in the same way that individuals do in urban centers and in different areas across the United States. And so I'm really grateful to be able to come here and join these meetings and listen to different perspectives and to take that back home with me. Um, so when it comes to um, diversity and inclusion, and working to ensure equity. Um, what are your thoughts on potentially implementing, um, I guess a sort of training or maybe um, a program which includes certain standards, such as I know that um, our school has looked into a program called Teaching Tolerance, um, you know, just different programs like that. What are your thoughts on maybe trying to implement one of those here in Kentucky um, as a requirement for each school? You know, I think that's a, a very, very, important step and there are a plethora of programs out there that are that are scientifically uh based that help us uh and i hate to use the term tolerance teaching tolerance i would like to switch tolerance because you're now you're asking me to tolerate me and i would like to change tolerance to respect and there are a plethora of programs out there that really help us uh, understand how we could and we should go about respecting each other and uplifting each other. Because that, that's what this really is about. It's uplifting each other. It's, uh, it's not about getting satisfaction because my culture is the dominant and we only see the, the world or we only view knowledge through my culture. And, uh, and I, I think, Caleb, that's what you're really getting at. Um, how can we begin to view, uh, learn experiences of different groups and respect and, and, and show, uh, really show respect for um, their way of, of learning? And so there are programs out there. Uh, I think Dr. Sweeney also talked about uh, mindfulness exercises. I kind of look at these two things the same. M how important mindfulness is in terms of us dealing with the stressors and anxiety in our life. And we finally got to that point because for a long time, we really uh, didn't see the importance of that. And that's something that COVID has now taught us. But now we look at how our society has changed. I mean, I, I look again at this beautiful mosaic of students here. I cannot go about uh, teaching, if I'm a classroom teacher or an administrator, just teaching the history and culture of just one group. I have to respect the experiences and the differences and the diversity that you all bring to the table. And so what I'll spend, what I'll do uh, uh, during my early days, early time in uh, in this new role is seeing what's out there. You know, what programs do we have out there? And I want to make sure that these are research-based programs that promote respect, that promote diversity, that back again promote uh, that promotes programs that promote mindfulness as well. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. All right, we've got uh, Amy, Amy Yang. Hi, Dr. Woods-Tucker. 
Okay, um, my name is Amy and I'm from Rowan County. And my question is, what would you recommend saying to students or people in general who don't believe black individuals are disproportionately affected in schools or in society, who think that opportunities are available for them and they simply don't want to pursue it? Well, that's, I, I want to think about this because when you started to ask that question, an answer started to form. And I said, well, let me let me uh, stop and hear your question again, because it's such a beautiful question. And Amy, I want to make sure I've captured it well. You're asking, how can we um, work with individuals who don't believe that every person has the same opportunity? Did I capture it well? Yes. But not even with every person, just specifically with black individuals, especially now with all the BLM protests, um, we're, we're seeing the conversation topic come up. And um, I, I've, I've had multiple instances when I've talked to people and they just don't believe that um, black people are being disproportionately targeted. Um, yeah. Well, and thank you for uh adding that additional specificity, because again, I, I wanted to start processing an answer and I wanted to hear it very clearly. And the first thing that has come to my mind, and I say this um, in a very, very modest way, I'll ask them to spend a day with me. I'll ask them to uh, sit down and I'll, and Amy, I'll sit down and talk with anyone from the uh, most liberal person to in the middle to the conservative person. And, and that's what I've, 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 I've tried to build part of my reputation on is to listen to anyone, what, even when they 100% disagree with me, uh, but I'm always respect folks and their, and their perspective. But I would ask them to at least have an open mind. And I would ask them, have you spent and since we're specifically talking about Black Americans, African Americans, I would ask, do you have an African American associate, a friend? Have you invited that person to your home? Have you been to that person's home? Have you been to that person's place of worship? Have you sat down and had a conversation about his or her life experience. Because one of the things I'm really looking forward to is not just sharing my story, my life experiences. I can demonstrate the racism is alive and well. That lack of opportunities, and it doesn't matter how accomplished you are. Folks will still, it doesn't matter. You're a two-time national superintendent of the year and that people respect you across the country. It doesn't matter. Folks will still look at you differently and will treat you differently. But I will say this, that our society has changed so much and you have people who care. You have Tony, you have Dr. Glass, and they've really been my heroes. I haven't said this publicly, but the last couple of months, they've been my heroes. That we do have, we do have, there are folks who believe that uh, people of color uh, should be complaining as we look at Black Lives Matter. But there are other folks out there who get it, who are of different ethnicities in different backgrounds. And one of the tough tasks we're going to have to do, we're going to have to share our stories and our experiences and challenge each other. Spend some time with someone, with an African-American, with an Asian-American, someone who's different than you. And there's an old, uh, and I'm going to chop it up, there's an, a, an old Native American saying, you cannot understand a woman or a man until you walk in their moccasins. And so we need to challenge folks, let's walk in this person's moccasins. Now, I would also say to people of color that we're not going to, this is tough and it's, it's going to be with us our entire life, but we cannot let that stop us from, from realizing our greatness. 
and that there are heroes and sheroes, whether it was from the civil, uh, you know, uh, we, we talked a little bit, uh, I think it was Kay talked about the, uh, you know, civil war and, and accurate history and so forth from the uh, birth of this country to the civil war, uh, to the civil rights movement. All of us, different backgrounds have come together for the betterment of our country. But uh, systemic racism is alive and well in this country here. And we all have a right to challenge it. But I think the first step is being open. The person who's saying it, ask that person, how much time have you spent with this African-American? What do you know about the black culture? What do you know about the black experience? And what I've, and Amy, what I found out is that that person knows very little. They're never going to be able to, never ever be able to experience life through my lens. But I think we are all born with a level of empathy. <clears throat> I think that's the second part of it. How do we, like mindfulness, how do we teach uh, empathy? And that's a question I'll certainly look forward to talking with Dr. Sweeney about in, in the stars is how do we uh, teach empathy? How do we uh, expand grit? I'm sure over the last couple of years, you've heard a lot about grit. You know, how do we uh, expand upon grit and empathy and understanding? Because that's where it starts. As Dr. Glass said earlier, some of these folks have it in their heart. How do they get it in their heart? They were taught it. And how do we begin to challenge those those thoughts? And that's what I've tried to live my life. And the last part of here, Amy, thanks for asking that very difficult question because it's personal to me. And uh, Tony, you're right. These are superstars here. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I've had a, a student advisory council. They're pretty good back in Colorado, but I tell you what, you all are knocking it out the park. Um, I've tried to live my life right, not taking on the pressure of the whole world, Amy, to be a model uh, the, the model African-American male, because I know there are a lot of things out there. I'm not perfect. And I know that there are things like racism and discrimination out there that I can't do a whole lot about. But I've tried to live my life uh, in the right way to to uh, show people who don't believe in the power of public education, who may not necessarily believe in the work of people of color, that we can do these types of things, that we can be successful and we have been successful. Amy, I wanted to uh, just quickly build on what Dr. Woodsucker was saying. Um, when you get in that discussion with someone who just refuses to accept that there's any systemic racism or differences uh, in people's ex experiences, you know, the facts are on your side. Um, and you can point to something like um, in, in the justice system, the differences between who gets arrested and who doesn't in routine traffic stops, what, how bail is set um, for people of color versus people who are white, um, the penalties that are uh, handed down for the exact same crimes. Uh, I mean, these, if, 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 if someone commits a crime, then the experience should be the same, right? Justice is supposed to be blind, but it's not. But uh, I think what to underscore what something of what Dr. Woods Tucker is saying, an argument around the facts only takes you so far. Uh, what really changes people, I think, is is getting them to understand and hear each other's stories and and perspectives. And I put in the uh, in the chat here one uh, one story from uh, a colleague of Dr. Woods Tucker and, and mine in in Colorado. His name's uh, Rico Munn, and he shared the story of of growing up. Um, a, a black kid and his father having a gun under the seat of the car in case they got pulled over by the police. Um, and that's not something that I grew up experiencing, um, it, but it's something that Rico grew up experiencing. And it's something that he knew he was going to have to explain to his two black sons uh, that this is what you have to think about, um, uh, th that this is a real threat for you. And so that that had a profound impact on me in, in shifting my thinking. So I think I think even beyond just an argument over the facts, it's it's getting to really hear people's stories. Well said, sir. Thank you, Dr. Woodsucker and Dr. Glass. I know that can be a difficult question, but I really appreciate you taking the time to dissect that slowly. Sure. 
It was an excellent question, Amy, and and uh, yeah, very very proud of of each of you um, for your questions this morning. I know that we've taken a long time on this, but there's a couple more uh, questions, and I want to make sure that each of you have your voices heard because obviously this was um, the biggest thing that you all wanted to talk about. So we will go next to um, Trevin, Trevin Bevins. Trevin, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Okay. I'm Trevin Bevins, and I'm from Pike County, and good morning, Dr. Woods-Tucker. And good. after the loss of George Floyd, you know, I saw our community come together and condemn what had happened, and people said racism doesn't exist in Pike County. It's not a thing here. But then not long after that, we had an incident with a college student in a business, all because he was a darker color skin than I was. He was categorized against just because of that. So... In my district, we don't have a very large percent of minorities, and I just want to really get down and discuss how we can make sure our districts with smaller amounts of minorities still are educated on racism. Yep. I think we had this conversation, um, um, you know, Jack raised this uh, question, I believe it was Jack. Uh, it's about putting in a support system. You know, whether it's in, again, K-12 or higher ed, you need to have a support system to help young people feel comfortable. If, they're not, if they don't feel comfortable, they're not going to be able to thrive. I go back to uh, uh, the Little Rock Nine. As I said, I'm from Arkansas. In that case, and you all have heard, and you're speaking of social studies, you've heard uh, of the Little Rock Nine. And those nine students being able to integrate uh, Little Rock Central High School. And, 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 and I mean, and, and it took uh, President Eisenhower having to bring out the troops eventually to protect those students. But those students eventually became successful there because there were a few, just a handful of staff members and community members and Later on through the years, a few brave students like you who surrounded the, those students and gave them a support system, gave them an avenue to express their feelings and also gave them some tools in terms of, of uh, you know, uh, being able to uh, be successful in their district, so uh, in, their, in their school. So I, I think it begins with having a strong, strong support system in place but you need fighters like you like each of you who are on this call here who will stand up you know folks who are, who are fearless in saying we will take on these ills of this country when we look at the uh, passage again of the, of the of the voters rights act people lost their lives and i don't want anyone to lose their lives over this but folks have to be fearless in saying, I am willing to take a stand, whatever that price may be, to bring about this change. Because that's the only way this change is going to happen. The birth of this country started over a war. It started over a war, a rebellion. And so we have to stand up and do what's right. And it's so difficult. And know that it is a lifetime. It is a lifetime fight. And, you know, and I've been fighting this fight for and experiencing this fight here for 55 years. And my heart is really warm today. I didn't know how I was going to uh, feel today. Uh, but my heart is warm today to hear from so many compassionate young people who want to make a change in this world. And it's going to take you all to make um, to make this change, uh, uh, the late uh, John Lewis, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase here. You know, he said that you know he talked about go out and get in some good trouble. He said we need to always do that, and we still need, and we'll always have to do that. Go out and get in some good trouble because this is good trouble to ensure that things are equitable. But he also said that uh, the torch had been passed from Dr. King and to him, 
And now what he's doing, he's passing the torch on to you all. And so you have the torch and we need to run with it and continue to fight for change. I think our, I think our better days are ahead of us. I really do. But uh, I'm touched by uh, the conversation here today. And we have to fight, fight and fight and know that this is a lifetime fight. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate and I, I think you will I think you will be pleasantly surprised, um, Dr. Tucker, by um, not just the students in this council, by, by by a lot of their colleagues and their I call them colleagues, but by their peers in their schools, because um, we had a lot of applications for this advisory council um, and a lot of interest. Um, and even if they're not able to be on this council, there's a lot of students who are wanting to, to do this kind of work. And so uh, in many in many cases, many of the students are wanting to uh, to or you know to kind of organize and 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 do this kind of work and and be the models. Uh, so I think that they're all I can tell they're very excited to to know what they can do next. So uh, the next student I have is Anastasia. Can you guys hear me? I can. Yes. Yes. Uh, good morning, Doctor Woods Tucker. Uh, Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, listening to the stories and the answers that you've given uh, throughout this in, um, questioning, it reminded me of um, a simulation that we do at the Kentucky United Nations Assembly every year. Yeah. We take a big universal problem and we take 30 minutes and the uh, presiding officers of the conference take different experiences from different people throughout the world that have dealt with the problem and they just explain it. Everybody, it's a dark, it's everybody is thinking and it really opens up people's um, thoughts and feelings for this problem. And uh, just hearing you speak, I think it would be great if you and other people of the minority do a simulation video or at some point after the pandemic's over do simulations where we hear from African Americans, Asians, and different minorities and have them share the experiences that they've dealt with versus what the average white would deal with. And I think it would be a real eye opener for many people throughout the community. Great idea. I like that. I would like to hear next time we talk, I would like to hear more about the model that you all work on each year. I would love to. I'll, I can find out more and I can when we meet next, I can share a little bit more about it. Thank you. And we are taking notes uh, as we do with all our advisory councils. So I'll be sure to make sure that that's noted uh, for you as well, Dr. Tucker. Dr. Sure. Tucker. All right. Um, next is Lauren. Lauren Little, she will wrap us up, um, and then Dr. Uh, Glass will uh, wrap us up on this uh, agenda item. Lauren. All right, yeah, this is going back to what Drake said in the chat, but a lot of people, when they go on social media, they think that they can just say whatever they want because they're hiding behind a screen, and that's where a lot of the racism comes from. So how can we spread awareness of this, and how can we make a change on our social media platforms? Wow, Lauren, that's probably the question of the day. Uh, we call it keyboard courage. You don't have to confront the person. They can lie on you. They can say, create all these disturbing stories about you. Uh, it goes back again to education. And we need to do a better job in, in K-12 in really teaching our students and our staff about the power of technology. Again, I'm going to uh, date myself and I'm not trying to sound like the founder uh, of the internet or of social media. In 1992, I began writing my dissertation, a book on email and the internet. And I had, I had the um, privilege of traveling to Europe and uh, studying abroad for a short while, and their internet uh, and email system uh, in Europe, in Belgium, in France, and the Netherlands for sure, 
were a little advanced than the than uh, the United States at the time in the uh, early nineties. And there was no way, Lord, I would have. I mean, we we talked about some stuff, and even in my study, I'd like, well, there's going to be telemedicine while people are going to be able to buy cars. And I talked about the issues of funding and access because we're experiencing some of that stuff now. But there was no way I could have at that time had even imagined the negative part of the internet where people are are sitting at home, as you said, behind their screens and really dragging people through the mud, creating lies and all types of stuff like that. And so I've spent some time lately thinking about this. How can we begin to combat that? It is with education. It's with starting very early. You know, you sign a, a waiver agreement saying that you're going to behave a certain way. But we need to do a better job in, in, in K-12 in helping people, again, understand the power, the enormous power of the Internet and social media and the negative aspect of it. And what I'm seeing right now, and I'm so uh, pleased to hear you all began, that you began your meeting, you know, talking with Dr. Sweeney and, and developing some coping and mindfulness type of activities, because we're in this era of COVID right now. I just could not imagine being a teenager now because you're so stuck, so tied to that screen. You, I mean, we're tied to it anyway, if we weren't in COVID, but now you're really tied to this computer screen. And how do we help young people develop coping skills and strategies, not only dealing with COVID, but also dealing with the negativity that comes by? And so, uh, again, we'll work hard here in, you know, in, in the Commonwealth here in, in Kentucky to uh, help people to be better citizens, to be uh, Internet or social media citizens in, in being respectful and also holding each other accountable. I think that's an important part through policies, uh, holding folks accountable when they break uh, that trust and they go out and they attack fellow students and they attack staff members. Thank you. Lauren, that was, an, that was a phenomenal question um, because I know many of you um, from talking to you that you have chosen not to be on social media for that very reason. Um, so again, something that we would love to work with you all on. Um, go ahead and Commissioner Glass, if you'd like to wrap up this agenda item. Well, this has been a great conversation. Uh, thanks uh, Thomas for being on with us and what a, what a, Fantastic uh, beginning uh, to your uh, your tenure here, and I know the students were thrilled to have you, and I was as well. Uh, I'm a uh, I'm a history teacher at heart, and uh, so much of this conversation has uh, made me reflect back on that connection that we started with, which is um, Dr. Woods Tucker's role as the chief equity officer and as effectively the chief academic officer for the state in in that that role as a deputy commissioner over, over teaching and learning. Uh, there's a lot of controversy right now around curriculum and what, whose facts are being taught and, uh, and how students are able to make sense of those. Um, a couple of, of those I want to put in, in the uh, chat for your consideration. One element of, of controversy has been this, uh, the New York Times 1619 project. Uh, which is a, um, a collection of essays and photos and thinking around the first uh, slave ships that came to the United States and um, and then the all of the questions that um, that grew uh, from that uh, and uh, then as a counter to that um, President um, uh, Trump announced the 1776 Commission really as a counterbalance to the 1619 project. So I think it's a really interesting discussion. Um, uh, and, and again, as a, as a public educator, we have an obligation to, um, I believe, expose you to different kinds of thinking and allow you to reach your own conclusions around what you think is, is, is right. Um, but this is, a, from a historical perspective, I think a really interesting contrast uh, in, in the story of, of the United States and, and how we make sense of it. Um, one other... Um, element just from a historical perspective. We recently relocated to the 
uh, Lexington area just a couple of months ago um, as I started this in this role of uh, commissioner. And, and we were driving through Lexington. Of course, I went to school at, at UK there. Um, but one of the things that I noticed, we were driving through downtown and there's an area called the Cheapside area. And Cheapside, when I was in school, was a, a place of kind of um, bars and restaurants. Um, but then I saw this sign around the Cheapside auction block. And it turns out that corner of the courthouse was a slave auction block in in Lexington. And so I'll put a little bit about from the um, uh, Explore Kentucky History site about that um, that auction site and the sign that's, that is there that describes um, – the, the auctions that took place and, and some of the historical documents that were collected about the people that were sold um, on, on that corner. So lot, I, think, I think lots of us, lo- lots of things for us to process through um, in, in dealing with a very complicated history as a nation and a very complicated history in Kentucky. Um, so um, Dr. Tucker, you've got your work cut out for you, but you're the right person for the job, sir. And we're looking forward to having you having you here in the state. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. I'm I'm at home. So thank you. Great. Um, so uh, shifting uh, gears, I think we're going to have to revise our agenda pretty substantially. Uh, Tony, this item took up um, a lot of time and it should. Um, and, and I think that's that's absolutely OK. We'll we'll um, uh, hold on to some of the other items that this, you raised up as students and bring those back together the next time. Really, all of these issues that you raised are incredibly important, and we want to make sure that we get to them. Why don't we uh, jump to that world language item, uh, make sure that our Office of Teaching and Learning staff has the opportunity to get some feedback on that, and then we'll take stock after that, Tony, and see where we are. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I do think the other two items on the agenda are certainly things uh, we're going to be talking about uh <laughs> where we are with NTI and remote learning uh, for the spring of 2021 in a month. Obviously, we might even be (laughs) in a different situation in a month and the other uh, as well. So who, um, I'm trying to figure out, uh, Office of Teaching and Learning staff, is it Erin that has joined us on that? Hi, Tony. Uh, This is Krista and Erin and Thomas have joined as well. So perfect. uh, Thank you very much. And and guys, thank you all for your time this morning uh, so that we can share some information on the world language standards. Uh, my name is Krista Hall, and I work in the Office of Teaching and Learning with my colleagues, Thomas Klaus and Aaron Chavez. And a lot of our work focuses around the uh, development and implementation of content standards for grades K through 12. And Currently, for about the last nine or 10 months, uh, we have had world language teachers from across the state that have been meeting um, to revise the current world language standards. Um, So before we get started, uh, I want to first see if you all can use your um, hand raising icon. How many of you all have had a world language class at some time during your education journey? I love to see all those hands go up. Okay, wow, Thomas, it looks like we have a pretty informed group here. Yeah, it's good to see so many of you all have had uh, that experience. And for some of you, there's still time if and, you know, there, there's still time to take those classes. And for some of you, you know, learning a language might, might be something that you do even outside of school. So good to see that so many people have had that kind of experience in their life. Uh, Aaron, if you wouldn't mind moving ahead. So. As as Krista mentioned, we've been working the last 10 months with teacher writers. So these teachers have come in and they've basically gone through and researched other states, uh, researched national standards, and put together a standards document on uh, on world language. Um, So what I wanted to share with you all is, is kind of their vision statement. So one of the first things they did was they really submitted out kind of what they wanted to be the foundation of this document. And I'm so glad that we were able to talk with you today because thinking about kind of their vision, a lot of it is tying to what that discussion previously was about, about equity, about centering um, 
knowledge and and access to all groups and making those diverse voices heard. So what I'd like for you to do, and there's four key bullets here, and they really focus on kind of centering the the teaching and learning of of language within the learning about culture and learning about um, uh, learning about culture and equity. So what I would like for you to do is just take a minute and just read through those, through those vision statements. And what I'd like for you to do after that is to really think, well, as you're reading through it, is really think about whether or not you agree with this vision. And then secondly, do you feel all points of these uh, of this vision are equal or are there some that deserve more emphasis? And so I posted those two questions in the chat box. And so what I'd like for you to do is just take a minute and read through those kind of vision markers, those vision bullets. And, and be thinking about those things. Is this, are these things that I agree with? Um, and then are some do some need to be more emphasized? And feel free to kind of uh, use the chat to let us know kind of your reaction, or if you want to raise your hand and we can we can hear from you and, and just let us know what, what your thoughts on uh, uh, thoughts are on this. Sorry. So yeah, just take a minute and read that, and just you're responding to your agreement and whether or not these are equal or some need to be more emphasized. And Krista and Thomas and Aaron, I was just going to let you know, too, that I will also put this in the exit form for the for them as well, so that I'm hoping that they will also, obviously, they'll, I know that they will, because this is a very vocal group, that they will share their thoughts on this, but I will also share the exit forms with you, because um, they do tend to spend time on the exit forms, where I'm sure that they will provide more information as well. So I will go ahead and exit and let you all run the uh, chat portion. Thanks, Tony. So, Thomas, um, I can go ahead and um, call on individuals to share out if we're ready for that. Yeah, that would be great. OK, I'm going to apologize when I say names incorrectly. I'll start with Caleb. Caleb, do you have a response? Yes. Well, um, let me first of all say that I think all of these are important. Um, however, two number, number two and number four on the screen really stand out to me. So um, although I have not had a world language class, I have had a class um, focused on world cult culture and um, the class analyzed different cult or has analyzed different cultures. I'm actually it right now. Um, and I just think it's really important with number two to have that, you know, that rich exposure to work um, on ensuring that, you know, people here, young people here in Kentucky understand people from different places and how um, their origin impacts their day-to-day -day life and I think that it um, in general will just lead to this um, just this greater understanding um, and also to this respect for one another and then as for number four I think it's important for us to um, ensure that young people here in Kentucky are able to see how minority groups um, you know your, your, your racial minority um, possibly you know the LGBTQ plus community and so on um, ensuring that they too are or the way that they are impacted in individual places and how um, the cultures of different areas, um, I'm not going to say treat them, but how how they are viewed differently um, in different cultures. So thank you. Thank you, Caleb. Yeah, th one of the things that the teacher writers really wanted to do was to ensure that language learning is not happening, happening in a vacuum, that it is kind of within learning about people, places, and practices to, to show that, you know, language – you know, language really changes and, and, and the way that people use language, it changes based on place. So the way that Spanish is spoken in Madrid differs greatly than how it's spoken in Buenos Aires. And so that's a huge part of kind of their thinking on that. Um, and then even thinking about um, with bullet four, as you mentioned, really ensuring that that they're laying out the framework with when they when and Aaron will talk about this in a minute, their sample learning targets, that they're inclusive, not just of racial inclusivity or LGBTQ plus, but also in thinking about the way that we talk about language learning. It's not just speaking and listening, but also signing for our, you know, for the people in our communities who are are deaf. So thank you. Okay. Is it is it Lohith? It is uh, it's Low Heath. Low Heath? Yes, Low Heath. From DuPont Manual. Low Heath, can you hear us? Did you have a comment to share, or with maybe your hand was still up from that you had taken a world language? Or if you have anything you just want to share with us about these now. Most definitely. 
Let me see if I can unmute him. Looks like he, oh, he's. Oh, yeah. Did you have your hand raised? Did you have a comment? Did you wanted to share with us? Oh, no, that was in response to something else. Okay, okay perfect. Okay, so Cade, did you have a comment for us? Yeah, I just wanted to add that I really like think that bullet point four is really important. Um, that emphasizing, you know, culture as part of a language class and then race um, and other topics as part of that culture. And I actually can have some experience with that because in my Spanish one class, I'm a senior now, so that was all the way back freshman year. But my um, teacher really tried to include like how race was viewed um, in a lot of Latin American cultures and countries um, and more about like just the, the individual countries and how their cultures differ even amongst, um, you know, those individual countries in, this, in the United States as well. And like, I, I don't know if really that was me, like really just enjoying hearing about the history and hearing about those countries or what, but I thought that was like incredibly valuable when we did it. And I think that as a whole, that would be really beneficial for all um, world language courses to really delve uh, more into that. No, th thank you so much, Caden. Yeah, I think even thinking about like in South America, the way race is talked about, um, where, you know, you do have, you know, groups like Mestizo, who in some countries are considered a race. And so that's very important and definitely kind of what the teacher writers were thinking there. And even looking at things like like gender, you know, there's a huge discussion about like the Latino, Latina, Latinx and kind of how to use Latinx and, and kind of where that where that is showing up. So even how gender is kind of um, addressed through language is a huge part of kind of what the teacher writers thought was important. Thank you. And then Thomas, it looks like we have a couple comments in the chat. Um, yep. Lauren stated that, that she does agree with this vision, believes that the second point should have more emphasis because learning the culture of other people helps you reflect on your own culture. Uh, and also believes that learning about other cultures would help people to connect with them more and would cause a decline in racism or harassment of other uh, minorities. And then it looks like Drake uh, responded with, I think the vision is incredibly relevant and I agree with it. I love that the vision speaks on the empowerment of students. I believe we can always expand on educating students on different cultures. World languages go beyond the phonics and grammar. And I think elevating the multifaceted cultures around the world is important. Yeah, and that's exactly kind of the the thought of the teacher writers is is there's much more than just learning the words, learning the context in which those words were formulated. Um, and, and the language was was you know made, changed, and continues to change. Language is not something that's static; it's dynamic, and it changes as cultures and changes as ideas come into play. So that's definitely what the uh, teacher writers were were trying to emphasize within this. Um, and then also, yeah, the the idea that there's this kind of transaction that as you're learning about other places and you're learning about other languages, you're also learning about maybe your own communities. And the way that your communities is is maybe has has developed and and had people come in who kind of are inherent or speak a different language or have a different culture. Or you're learning about your community and you're learning about the world. Thank you all. Yes, and thank you, Thomas. So we very much support um, the um, students really being partners and advocates in their own educational journey. And one of those pieces is really being informed about what the expectations are of students in their classroom. And so when we look at standards, which standards are what define what we expect students to know and be able to do by the time they end a, a grade or a course in that content area. And so our standards documents, while our teachers use them to develop their curriculum and to plan uh, their daily lessons for students, parents and students can use those to be informed on what they can expect to even occur in that course during the year. And so I, I will say it's very technical writing. Uh, it's it's maybe not an exciting read, but if you're really into uh uh, manuals or manufacturer warranty reading, then this will be right up your alley. So Aaron is going to quickly show you the uh, framework for the standards so that you can understand um, the components of it. And then at the end, uh, and, and Tony, this may be something either in the exit slip or in a follow-up email. We do have... Um, we wanted to provide the draft standards document to the students, as well as we have a Google survey link for them to respond to a couple questions for those that um, are willing to go through that. So um, 
however you would like to send that to them, we would definitely appreciate that. So Aaron, I'll, I'll let you share our the architecture for this as well. Just as a quick time uh, check in, um, Krista and Thomas and Tony and Aaron, uh, we have about five minutes left before we're going to need to uh, close up. Yes, sir. We we will get through this quickly. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you all. Um, okay, so what you should be seeing is um, an actual page from the standards document on how to read the uh, draft Kentucky Academic Standards for World Language. Um, there are actually five standards. Um, this happens to be one of the pictures of um, the communication standards. Um, and you can just kind of see it's like a how-to piece. Um, you have the standard and the mode of communication. There are three different modes um, for those. You have the interpretive guiding questions, and those questions are really what teachers are thinking about on, you know, are my students getting there? Are they learning that content um, of how to learn that language or in that culture? Um, it also makes connections to the other three goal areas, which are connections, comparisons, and communities, which are embedded throughout um, the sample learning targets, which is what you all might be most um, familiar with. Um, sometimes uh, teachers post the sample learning targets on the board, um, and they just make sure that they are including those equity issues, um, racial equity, the LGBTQ+, plus, um, the writers really wanted to ensure that that language was embedded with those uh, learning targets. Um, also there, if you notice, there's some proficiency benchmarks, and that's just kind of like the progression of the standards. And um, there's a novice, there's intermediate and advanced. And so it's you kind of move through those levels as you're learning a language, um, which also enhances your um, first language learning experience as well. Um, I think that's about it. I know this is probably very technical um, writing um, to you all. Do you have any questions about any of the components of the architecture that the writers have developed? And Chris or Thomas, if you'll help me out with the chat because I can't see it right yes, now. Yes, we're monitoring it. Okay. So hopefully as you go through the draft document, this will help you understand what all of the pieces are so that when you give us that feedback, uh, we definitely appreciate that. So if there aren't any other questions or comments, um, I do want to just give you one challenge. And, and that is if you're currently in a world language course or if you took one previously, whatever that language is, change your phone to that language. It will give you daily practice in uh, common words and phrases. Uh, a side benefit is if your friends don't know that language, all of your messages stay private. So have a great week. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, uh, folks from our Office of Teaching and Learning team. I'm not sure if I'll uh, take you up on that suggestion, uh, Krista, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I uh, might end up uh, driving myself crazy trying to keep up with, with all of that. Um, but uh, great session today, students. Uh, thanks for participating. Thanks, uh, Dr. Woods Tucker, uh, for leading us through that conversation around um, equity. Thanks, Office of Teaching and Learning staff, uh, for that great conversation around the world language standards. Uh, we have a couple of other items that I think uh, are going to be really important. And um, uh, Dr. Woods Tucker, I, I think this would be a great opportunity to engage you again on the two topics we didn't get to, because uh, one of the powerful uh, approaches of, of your role being a chief equity officer and um, this connection with teaching and learning is to help bring that lens of equity into everything that we do. And so the, the two topics that the students wanted to talk more about that we didn't really get a chance to touch on today are one uh, around standardized testing and the second is around the uh, experience of remote learning and, and how that may continue, uh, both of which mm -hmm. have huge equity considerations. Um, uh, as, as we'll talk about next time, one of the reasons that we have a system of standardized testing in this country is out of a concern around equity and what services were being provided to uh, black, brown kids, kids with disabilities, uh, kids that come from uh, economically disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, so that's, that's one of the major components of why there's a testing system 
in the United States. And I recall um, President uh, George W. Bush talking about the soft bigotry of low expectations when No Child Left Behind was implemented that led to the system of testing that we have. So there's a complicated intersection between testing and equity uh, that we can get into some more detail on. Uh, And then this other element uh, around the shift to remote learning uh, that we had this spring, uh, several, uh, some districts in the state are still in remote learning. Some of you are going through experiences where you're going from in-person to remote. And if you haven't gone through that, you are likely to uh, over the course of this spring. That um, uh, disruption of shifting to remote learning has exacerbated and lifted up the inequities that we have in the state again um, and made them even more clear. So I think that's an opportunity for us to talk about these um, uh, these two important issues through a lens lens of equity. And, and we'll actually have uh, Dr. Woods Tucker be on board with us officially the next time we get together. Uh, Tony, any last uh, comments just as we close up here? Yes, I just wanted to really um, thank our students. I know every time I come on here, I'm always like a proud mama with you all, but I'm so proud of each and every one of you for always uh, contributing to the conversation. Um, it's never it's never a problem uh, with this particular advisory group for you all to speak up and share um, your thoughts and your minds uh, with what we're asking you. Um, I know it's not always an easy discussion, um, but we also at the Department of Education want to thank you for what you are doing to help mitigate the COVID-19, um, you know, this this virus that we're going under. I know many of you have mentioned that you're having to do some of the quarantining um, and we know that that's not easy for you to do. Um, and we know that our schools are having to do a lot of the the heavy, you know, the hard hitting. And I know Dr. Glass has, has talked to the superintendents about this. And we just really appreciate the work that you all are doing to and playing the part that y'all are having to do. Uh, many of you are athletes and, and band members and, and participate in extracurricular activities. We know this is an incredibly hard time for you and, and that this is not an ideal school year. Um, as it was not for the class of 2020, or and it's not going to be for the class of 2021 or 2022. Uh, we just really appreciate um, the sacrifice that you all are having to make as part of your education, and we want to try to do whatever we can to to help with that. And uh, back to you, Commissioner. Okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, for organizing all this. Thank you, Dr. Woods Tucker, for being on with us. Thanks, uh, everybody from the Office of Teaching and Learning for the incredible work that you're doing on the uh, all of the standards, including the world language standards. And thank you, students, for being with us. We will see you next time. Thank you, guys. I will send the exit slip your way. Thank you.